uprightly self-awakened one. Homage to the Blessed One, Noble One, the rightly self-awakened one. Homage to the Blessed One, Noble One, the rightly self-awakened one. Welcome to all the monks and novices and blessings to all the laity. This Friday we learn Dhamma about the topic of humbling and lowering oneself. In Pali, this is called Niwatocha. This is not inflating oneself, being modest, being humble, lowering one's head, having beautiful manners, being refined and gentle, not being coarse and rough, like a poisonous snake whose fangs have been taken out and is not vicious anymore. One who is deferential through body, speech and mind has a great blessing in one's life. And in Pali, this is the word niwata, which translates as no wind, not inflated. One can control oneself to be in a normal state according to truth, like a ball that has not been inflated not showing off one's skill that one knows one has to others, or using these skills to belittle others or to boast, not boasting that one is good and not being arrogant, but behaving as modest and reserved, being someone who is very humble and meek. Its characteristics are similar to having respect, but it has a different meaning. Respect and reverence is being aware of the goodness and virtue of others or of other things. And then one behaves to that person with respect and reverence, mainly shown through one's body and speech. In regards to humility and lowering oneself, this is being aware of oneself and one is able to behave correctly and appropriately. Not being arrogant in any way not boasting and exaggerating the truth, not raising oneself up and putting others down. One is polite and has manners that give respect appropriate to another's status. And one knows the appropriate time and what time is appropriate or what time is inappropriate. This is important. And for the person who behaves arrogantly and conceitedly, this has many faults. One, it can ruin a person. That is, they aren't able to go back to being ordinary the way things were before. They ruin their future. Like some people are good people, but when they receive praise, or they change from someone who doesn't have much, and they suddenly become a multi-millionaire, then they will usually be showing off, dressing up to look rich, and boasting about their wealth. Or those who gain wisdom, they boast of the wisdom they have, in their knowledge and education. There are many like this. This can ruin a person. And it makes one lose friends. No one wants to be friends with one. And even if one has friends, they won't likely be true and real friends. And it ruins the group. Each person holds themselves as being good. And they won't be able to agree on anything. In the end, they won't be able to get to their goal and it makes other people around them tired. But being humble and lowering oneself has three outstanding characteristics. One has manners that are humble and refined. Their words are sweet, and their mind is gentle. These are three characteristics. And making oneself be humble and lowering oneself has principles to it as well. One needs to meet and associate with Kalyanamitta, that is, good friends that have sila dhamma, morality. They will warn us and pull us to go in a good and correct way. Because it is normal that we people don't have knowledge, understanding and wisdom all the time. Sometimes we can forget. But if we associate with wise people, we have excellent kalyanamitta, then they can warn us so that we will see the virtue in moderation and being content. 
we will see the virtues in humility and lowering one's conceit. They will warn us and pull us to go in a good way. And we ourselves need to know how to think and reflect, observing causes and results constantly. Because the nature of humans is that each person's minds are different. Each person thinks differently and of different things. But we need to contemplate and investigate causes and results and keep oneself on a good path. And there needs to be harmony in one's group that it can go according to basic principles. Sometimes we can admonish each other. So that is why the Buddha laid down the principle that after the rain's retreat, the Sangha can admonish each other. To listen and respect the thoughts of others that has logic and reasoning. So it's not that we are stubborn in our own views that leads to arguments and disagreements. It comes from attachment to that I am right. And being attached to oneself as right, one then can be wrong. There was one time when I was assisting Venerable Ajahn Chah. I wrote a letter that Ajahn Chah was going to send one monk to be an abbot of a branch monastery in Ayutthaya province. But there was a problem with the wording, sent to go there or sent to come there. Some monks in the group said the wording was sent to go there, but some monks said the wording should be sent to come there. And there were two senior monks who started to argue that sent to go was correct, and the other monk said sent to come there had to be used. So Venerable Ajahn Chah said out loud, There is no flag and there is no wind. When there is a flag and there is wind, then there will be arguments that the flag flaps because of the wind, or it's only because there is the flag that it can flap. So they argued. Each monk had their own attachments. So Venerable Ajahn Chah said the Dhamma verse, There is no flag and there is no wind. This is beyond causes and above results. So there was no more argument. So humility and lowering oneself is an important virtue, especially when one is of few wishes and contented. Then they will be praised by all people. And our Lord Buddha, he praised Venerable Mahakasapa Tera, that he was one who was humble, one who had few wishes and had contentment. In the Mahayana tradition, there is a story about Venerable Mahakasapa that is worth listening to and learning from. Let us watch together from the Dhamma of the Mahayana tradition. I would like to ask to tell the story like this, that if you were the richest person in your city, what would you do? Something incredible happened in the city of Rajagir more than 2,500 years ago. The boy Pipali, the son of a wealthy family, was weary of the world and wanted to find the truth of life. He wanted to live peacefully and learn the Dhamma, but because of his gratitude, he couldn't go against his parents' wishes. They wanted him to settle down and have a family of his own. So they found one wealthy family who had a daughter called Kapilani and arranged their wedding. When the two had married, the second incredible occurrence appeared. It was the opposite of what one would expect from external appearances. Both of them felt the same way inside. They were weary of the world. They wanted to find the truth of life. After their parents passed away, Pippali consulted Kapilani. He said he wanted to renounce the world and ordain, to search for the truth of existence. They would give all their wealth to the workers and the land to the villagers. And she agreed. Isn't that incredible? Before Pippali went to search for a teacher, he promised Kapilani that if he found someone who had discovered the truth of life, he would come back for her and take her to practice the Dharma in line with those teachings. Pippali went out wandering, 
searching for a teacher, and he traveled for many years before he found one. Ultimately, he met the Buddha. As soon as Pipali met the Buddha, he quickly bowed and asked to be his disciple. The Buddha said, I know the truth of life. And he further gave a vow of truth. If I do not know, but say that I know, or do not understand yet claim to understand, may my body split into seven pieces at this very moment. Upon hearing this, Pipali gained even more faith and requested to ordain as a monk. He received the name Venerable Kasapa. He listened to the teachings of the Buddha continuously without missing a single word. Later, he followed the Buddha to go back to Vilavana Monastery to practice the Dhamma there. Now, the disciples of the Lord Buddha had a monastic code to keep with many rules. They practiced very strictly as well. None of this, however, was a problem for Venerable Kasapa. He carried it all out in full. One day, during a Sangha gathering, the Buddha gave the most difficult Dharma teaching. He taught that all Dharmas arise from the mind. Everything arises due to causes and ceases due to causes. After the Buddha spoke, he asked his disciples if they understood, and none of them did, other than Venerable Kasapa, that is. The Buddha asked for Venerable Kasapa to come and sit next to him and explain the meaning of this teaching to everyone else. But Venerable Kasapa modestly thanked the Lord Buddha for his kindness and replied, I have no right to sit next to you, Lord, let alone explain the teachings in your place. I cannot accept. I ask only to be one of your disciples and listen to your teachings. Just this is enough for me. After he uttered these words, he stood up and walked off. The Buddha did not find fault with them. He wasn't upset, and said to those gathered, Only eight days after Kasapa met the Tathagata, he penetrated into the very heart of the Dhamma. He seeks out seclusion, has few wishes, and does not speak what is not beneficial. He lives in line with the Vinaya. Herein, all of you should follow Kasapa's example. And after this, they called Venerable Kasapa the young man at peace. Humility and consideration were two more virtues that Venerable Kasapa held in high regard. Though we had met a teacher who had realized the truth of life, the Buddha, he was not able to go and get Kapilani in order to practice the Dhamma together. It was only when the Buddha accepted female disciples that he brought her to practice in the same place, and she was determined to practice too. The Buddha eventually praised her as a bhikkhuni who was skilled in recollecting her past lives. On top of this, there was quite a significant teaching that Venerable Kasapa gave through his example. One morning, Venerable Upanandi and his friends went into a village for alms. But they were shocked to see that everyone, both the poor and the rich, closed their doors and windows and hid. This was because Venerable Upanandi had pressured the villagers to make donations so he could build a dwelling for himself. Venerable Kasapa saw this and thought, I've got to reprimand this friend of mine. But his method of teaching was through his actions. Venerable Kasapa walked on arms until he met one sick old woman. Her body was filled with boils of pus. She was close to death and had nothing, no wealth, no money. All she had was a bowl of stale porridge. When Venerable Kasapa met her, he asked for alms. She said she was poor, living in poverty, and she had nothing to give. Venerable Kasapa replied, Well, what about your kindness? That's what's truly important. You have a heart that wishes to give. And whoever has a heart that wants to help others is not poor. Upon hearing this, the old woman's spirits were lifted. She offered the porridge to Venerable Kasapa. But you know that as she was pouring it into his bowl, the pus from a split in her finger dripped in as well. Venerable Upanandi and his friends, who were watching from behind, were repulsed. They wore horrified expressions on their faces. But Venerable Kasapa, however, was not disgusted. He ate that entire bowl of porridge until none was left. What's more, he thanked the old lady. 
He told her, I have finished today's meal, and I now have enough strength to sustain this life until tomorrow. This is because of your gift that you have offered. My deep thanks to you. Venerable Upanandi's group, who were watching from hiding, were ashamed. Some of the monks fell to the ground and sat there. When they returned to the monastery, they told the Buddha what had happened, and he responded with words of praise. Venerable Kasapa is one who speaks just a little, but teaches through his deeds. He relieves the suffering in people's hearts. He instructs the Sangha through his actions. On the day of the Buddha's final passing into Parinibbana, Venerable Kasapa and his group were off wandering through the forests and countryside. They weren't able to make it in time for the Buddha's passing. When Venerable Kasapa heard the news, he was shocked. But there was something else that was even more shocking that made him very worried. This was the reaction of his disciples. There was one group led by our old friend Venerable Upanandi who were pleased. There was no Buddha around to reprimand and control them. They could do whatever they wanted. And there was a second group who were weeping in grief like madmen. Venerable Kasapa thought to himself that if it's like this when only seven days have passed, how could the sasana possibly continue on for a long time? So he hurried to pay respects to the Buddha's body. At the cremation ceremony, Venerable Ananda tried to light the pyre many, many times, but it would always go out. This carried on happening until Venerable Kasapa arrived. He paid his respects to the Buddha's body and made the sincere vow. Lord Buddha, I have been born anew. From now on, I won't enjoy the flavor of the Dhamma only by myself. I will be like the sun, burning myself up for the remainder of this life in order to spread the true Dhamma. May you rest your heart at ease. I will follow my vow. Not long after Venerable Kasapa uttered these words, the pyre that Venerable Ananda had tried to light many times lit itself and came ablaze. Ninety days after the Buddha's Parinibbana, Venerable Mahakasapa held a Sangha meeting of 500 monks. This was the first Sangha council of the Tripitaka in the Satipani cave. Venerable Mahakasapa saw Venerable Upanandi sitting outside, despondent. He called him in to join the meeting, but Venerable Upanandi wasn't sure if he was allowed in because of his past actions. Venerable Kasapa told him, If it wasn't for you and the Buddha, I would be a silent and lone renunciant, only enjoying the happiness of being by myself. But I gained the aspiration to gather everyone together to hold the first Sangha council, and this rightful deed belongs to you. Venerable Upanandi was deeply moved and started to cry. We have learned now from the Mahayana cartoon, and we can see the Buddha held Venerable Mahakasapa to be like a close friend, not just as a disciple. This was deep within the Buddha's heart and greater than that of other disciples. Though the other disciples did not understand the teaching, but Venerable Mahakasapa understood, and the Buddha gave teachings to Venerable Ananda and Venerable Mahakasapa until the end of his life. Venerable Ananda listened to all the Buddha's teachings and memorized them. And Venerable Mahakasapa was like the second Buddha. He practiced to know for himself. So may you learn about the history of Venerable Mahakasapa. He was foremost of all the monks in the Dutanga austere practices of the Lord Buddha. And he continued the Dhamma Vinaya the monastic discipline, and held the first Sangha council as well. And we can imagine that if we were that sick old woman, then we would be extremely lucky that she was able to pay respects to Venerable Mahakasapa. The Buddha said that no matter how much prestige and status one has, being born like this for thousands of lifetimes, it would not be equal to bowing to Venerable Mahakasapa just one time. Although we can't remember if we were born at that time, but when we are aware of this, 
we can homage our minds to bow to Venerable Mahakasapa, bowing with our heart that has faith in the Venerable Arahant, free of all defilements, the one who practiced upholding the Dutanga practices and who held the first Sangha council. So this is our great merit and goodness that Venerable Mahakasapa had the thought to hold the first Sangha council so that there would be a strong lineage of the Dhamma Vinaya carried on to the present day. So may you all, the monks and novices, be firmly established in the Dhamma Vinaya and all the laity be established in Sila Dhamma and then puja the Buddha Dhamma Sangha with your Dhamma practice. May the laity grow and prosper. (music) 